Yeah, well, look, look man. Bismillah. Let's get, let's, 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 man, let's, let's get into it, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm about to serve Jen in a little bit, man. Oh, yeah, so uh, how, how much time you got? Till like 7 o'clock? Bismillah, that's, that's, that's about right, yeah. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. All right, well, well, appreciate you guys coming on. Uh, Omar Lee and Obedullah Evans, two folks who need no introductions to listen to this podcast. Even though Omar's been on bef- on this platform before, but Obed Allah Mez is like a celebrity on the scene, so like it, there's no introduction. If y'all don't know about him, then you know unsubscribe right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so man, um, on, oh, 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 the the context of this of this of this particular particular episode is about the plight of converts, people who convert to Islam, <laughs> and uh, Omar had written an article what about a, three weeks to a month ago, I think it was, mm-hmm. regarding some of the things he's seen in the community in his what you've been muslim now 30 30 years or almost yes. 30 years 30 years 30, right yeah. um, and sure. just kind of and just kind of wanted to just talk about yeah. that and bounce some things off of bay both of y'all being converts so i'm just here to facilitate this conversation i just kind of want to start from the get-go and this is uh the, the questions are something that umar sent out to us mm. point number one and we'll go this way is it ethical to accept converts into a dysfunctional house. Omar, can you ex- elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by that? Um, like, what, what's an example? Because as someone, like, what do you mean a dysfunctional? Like, if so, are you saying that someone is not Muslim, they become Muslim, and then their home life is just a mess? Like, they're going to get, like, kicked out of their house? What, what, no, no, no. What do you no, mean by no, that? No, no, you, no. You, no, you missed them, man. You missed them. What do you mean? This, what do you mean? this is what I'm saying, and Ubaidullah knows what I'm talking about. In the last few years, I've had a couple of people in St. Louis come to me and they say, hey, I'm interested in Islam. Can you recommend a master to me? Can you recommend a place for me to go? And these are people in the inner city, North St. Louis. Okay, so we look at the the situation of the massage in the city of St. Louis. Uh, We have Salafi, um, which is very small, and we know what the issues are within that community. I don't have to get into that here. We have several very ethnocentric immigrant organizations where I know they're not going to be accepted. It's not necessarily animus. It's just those places are set up in an ethnocentric manner. Mm-hmm. And then we have two Masajid. Uh, one is barely open. When it is open, it's a contest between tech theories and dolphins. Uh, why would I want anyone to, you know, to say, why would I want anyone in this environment? You know, I was one of the people, me and he, yeah, me and Imam Suhaib Webb were two of the people that helped to found that master when we were students of Sheikh Rahman. Now you look, I mean, dope dealers, dope fiends. I, I don't like being, you know, that's the environment I come from. I don't like being around those type of people. I don't like being around that negativity. I have an old head friend of mine from East St. Louis. He did 14 years in Illinois prison. He's a real Muslim success story. Took Shahada in uh, Joliet, I believe. And uh, he said when he got out of prison, because he knew it would be illegal for him to carry a gun. He said everywhere he goes, he asked himself this question. Do I need a gun to go to this place? And if mm-hmm. the answer is yes, he don't go. You sometimes uh-huh. Masha'Allah. So, I obeyed Allah. Uh, what, what, what do you say to this question? Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ba'ad. But before answering the question, I just want to express gratitude to my brother Maheen for inviting me on. Um, and to my, brother, to my brother Umar, man, for conversing with me. You know, Umar, Lee and I, man, we go back some ways. And... Uh, I followed his work since rise and fall of the Salafi Dawah. And um, I've, I've always, mashallah, uh, held him in high esteem. And I've always, um, you know, respected him very highly because like, he, to my right. mind, to, to my mind, is an example of what Islam does for people, man. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I remember him saying that, you know, before he started writing, he was really just driving taxi. Right. You know, was just driving taxi. And um, just discovered this latent, just discovered this this hidden, this sleeping talent, you know, for chronicling current events, uh, writing in a, a beautiful but accessible way, 
So, you know, uh, it's an honor for me, man, to be in conversation with my brother, Umar Lee. Um, an honor Likewise. for me to be on Likewise. your platform, you know, Mahi. Um, uh, to the question, well, if I'm answering uh, on the basis of principle, we always invite people to Islam. Mm -hmm. In as much as we understand Islam to be a source of individual salvation. However, to Umar's point, we lament the fact that if a person joins our community, they probably won't have an institutional home, especially, and this is one of the things that, you know, I've heard nobody articulate the way Umar Lee has articulated it. Most of the people who become Muslim are people who are seeking some kind of radical redefinition. Because if they weren't seeking a radical redefinition, why would they embrace Islam? Right. 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 If if I did not need to um, redefine my life, what need would I have for a religion that is probably radically different than everything to which I'm accustomed to religiously? Right. Mm. So when a person becomes Muslim, the community. Uh, the community is of, 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 of absolutely paramount importance, man. I mean, yeah. a lot of folks becoming Muslim are people that have maybe dysfunctional home lives, maybe people uh, recently released from prison, maybe people getting out of toxic relationships, maybe people with mental health issues, maybe people who are impoverished. So if we are a Muslim community, and our community is focused on da'wah, we have to know that this is not knowing how to get in an elevator and give somebody an elevator pitch about Islam or knowing how to talk to, you know, your colleagues in the professional setting in which you work about Islam. It's about is our community set up in a way that offers some stability, offers some hope, offers some resources to you know, the vulnerable people that will probably be coming through our doors when we think about converse. And the, the fact of the matter is that the answer is no. You know, you either have communities uh, that just, this is not within their purview of consideration. This is not something they're really thinking about. Or you have individuals and communities that think about this, but they don't have the resources. Don't have the resources, yeah. To really make an impact. Right. Uh, in, in, in ways that we need to. So do I think it's ethical? Yes. I mean, I would always uh, tell somebody about, you know, the good of Islam, and I would always encourage a person to embrace Islam. When I do, however, I have to give them a disclaimer. Okay, look, you are from this point, you on your own, man. Right. You're not, you, you, you probably won't find uh, a supportive community. So right. if, if, if that is something that you know you're going to need to maintain your deen, then we just gonna have to just work together, man, to, um, uh, to, to, to see to it that we strengthen each other and we support each other in ways that we can. But I, but I understand the question that he's asking. Okay, cool. And Omar, do you have anything to add before we move on to the next point? No, let's move on to the next uh, question. Cool, I love this question. Um, <laughs> Aren't most white converts just identity seekers? Now, now, let me first, before I add my comment to that, before I throw it to the Sheikh, something he just said. I think I think we all have to realize that this dean is something very powerful. And the tools it gives you is something very powerful. And I'll tell anybody, if you look how I became a writer, and I'm talking about a guy like me, no English classes past the ninth grade. When I started writing, I didn't know the fundamental rules of grammar. And I still don't know, know a lot of them, right? But to be published in the nation, to be published in the Atlantic, I mean, major publications, right? Numerous articles uh, in St. Louis-based publications. All that education came not from college, but from the... Most community, and I had a community embrace me 
whether people like Shabda Rahman, uh, Abbasir, who just passed away, uh, and the numerous, uh, numerous mentors I had, this was my education. Because I always said, I'm going to sit with people more educated than myself. I'm going to sit with people of a higher level of knowledge than myself. And as I traveled around the country, you know, I always like to travel. I sat with them, whether it was Sheikh Ali Tamimi and, and Jaffa Sheikh Idris in Virginia, or with the elders in Brooklyn, the elders in New Jersey, Philip, wherever I was at. I always like to be with the old heads because I always feel I could learn from them. Mm -hmm. it gives, gives you that experience. Um, but to this specific question, I can't divorce myself from the equation. So if you look at a young Omar Lee, 17 years old, in North St. Louis County, and we've seen what happened the whole country, what happened in August 9, 2014, when Mike Brown is killed by police officer Darren Wilson, right? This changes America culturally, politically forever, this movement that arises. That was the kind of racial tension um, I had been brought up in that exploded on that day. I think he froze. Yeah, I think so. So you divided? Oh, he's all right. You're back. So, oh, I'm I'm back. Yeah, you you, you cut off for like 15 seconds. Okay, yeah. I was I was saying there was nothing on the day Mike Brown was killed, August 9, 2014, that didn't exist 30 years before that or 20 years before that or 10 years before that. So this was a very racially divided place. I'm from a, a racially a mixed family. Uh, I'm trying to figure out this situation, my place in the world. You know, Malcolm Islam is presented as this universal brotherhood. And like a lot of people in my generation, people like Abu Noor in Chicago, uh, we saw this as a rope, Islam as a rope to something better, as a place, uh, that were there was this oneness in humanity. So this was my identity seeking. I'm not divorcing myself from the equation. And then we see in post 9-11 and progressive politics, intersectionality becomes important. It's important to have an identity, the two, three, four, five. I mean, you go to the Twitter handers, they'll be like, he, neurodivergent, left, you know, you, you know, on and on and on. And so Islam becomes kind of a quick identity to pick up. And what I've noticed is you have a lot of younger converts in particular, not really that interested in religion. They're interested in free Palestine, hummus, biryani, you know what I'm saying? Uh, not so much in thick or religion. It's, it's just kind of like a, you know, hey, I, you know, I got friends at the hookah bar now. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, um, and then at the extreme fundamentalist edge, this woman, Allison Flukes, who just arrested school teacher, used to teach at the Muslim school in Kansas City, went over to Syria, joined ISIS, got one of her kids killed in a bombing. Feds picked up six of her children. I mean, it's an extreme example. And I have no sympathy for this woman, but I have sympathy for those children. One of the kids, the older ones I helped uh, to get back to the U.S. a few years ago, but what that fundamentalist edge that she went off. Now, most are not going to join ISIS. Very few are. But we've seen people go into fundamentalism, extremism mm -hmm. as kind of like, as Obed Allah says, this alternative. You know, a lot of people are looking for the alternative. They're not necessarily become a Muslim. They might become a Hare Krishna. They might, be, they might convert to Judaism or Orthodox Christianity or, or atheism. Anything you know, the facial tattoos, the green hair, anything that can be a rejection against what they see as normalcy as their upbringing, you know? Mm -hmm. No, no, wait a minute. You know, man, I, I think, you know, one of the things that we have to remember, man, is that, you know, I mean, the original sin of this country is undoubtedly racism. Yeah, no doubt. And while a lot of people talk about the impact of that racism on black Americans, 
very few people talk about the impact of that racism on white Americans. Mm. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So, right. you know, I, I know now it's a, 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 a often ridiculed trope to talk about like the self-hating, white mm. liberal, mm. Uh, this kind of self-flagellating, perpetually guilty white person. And, you know, I, I think it's easy to mock, it's easy to ridicule, it's easy to poke fun, but, you know, one one qaida, you know, one kind of spiritual principle that I reflect on often is that guilt is to the soul as pain is to the body. Mm. You know how when you when you when you feel some pain in the body, you know that something is wrong. Usually when you feel guilt in the soul, it's not because this guilt is a a, a pro, you know, a product of uh you know, it's not a figment of your overactive conscience. No, there's something that you truly feel guilty about. Mm. You know what I mean? And I think that um, a lot of white American converts that I've spoken with did have, at the very least, an ambivalent relationship with whiteness. At the very most, a hostile relationship with certain uh, conventional notions of whiteness before they embraced Islam. Yeah, yeah. And I don't. It's a rejection of whiteness for a lot of people. For a lot of people, and yeah. I, I and, and I don't find that. Um, now I, I I worry about the sustainability of that. See, I worry about you know where will that you know if your religious yes. embrace is yes. really uh, just a you know kind of a, a deepened and extended uh, kind of guilt. Right. About or rebellion. Being white. Or, mm. or 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 an attempt to escape, you know, uh kind of this pervasive idea of whiteness. I don't know if that's gonna be able to carry you. Yes. yes. I don't know if that's going to be able to really root your devotion yes. Yeah. In, in in the way that you know being a sincere Muslim will mm. require. You know, it might be easier just to become a hip hop artist or yeah, exactly. start, start break dancing or something like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, study yeah. Africana studies or something like that. I don't right. know if this is, is going to really propel you in the mm. way that religious life will require. Right. But I also don't want to belittle that because on the on the other end of that or, or the other side of that coin, a lot of black people embrace Islam because of identity. Exactly. You know, man, one thing that the, the, the Nation of Islam and the Morris Science Temple of America and Black Peace Stone Nation and all of those groups that played a significant role in my past, they created this impression for me that becoming Muslim would make me a truer, realer, more yes. natural Black man. Yeah, exactly. It wasn't just about salvation. It wasn't like, I'm doing this because I want to go to heaven. I did think that Islam was something black to do. A and return that, that, to that authentic was, blackness. Right, it was a more authentic blackness. And that right. was something that was very attractive to me. So I say that, you know, saying yes to, to Umar's question. I, I do mm -hmm. think a lot of people that embrace Islam are identity seekers, white and black. Now, people who embrace Islam more as a cultural identity, right? Not, um, you know, because what I'm talking about is like, I think a lot of us, Islam contained some some of the initial attraction to Dean was, you know, through questions and issues of identity. But once we embraced Islam, we found, I mean, it's like a whole religion, man. You got right. like rituals. And, and, yeah. yeah, you got, you know, you got like, there's a whole, there's, there's a whole right. thing to this. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You know, right. but people that are content to kind of have their religious, their religious, I guess, identity, for lack of a better word, just suspended, um, you know, and their, their religious development suspended so that they're really thinking about hummus and hookah and, you know, different, Politics. you know, different political struggles. Right. You know, hey, man, look. Everybody is. Everybody has to start somewhere, man. Yeah, yeah. Everybody starts somewhere. I think mm -hmm. one of the mistakes that sincere religious people make is they assume that everybody that embraces religion is having like this 
real moment of conviction, this deep God. Mm. You know, for some people, religion ain't even like that. You know, yeah. I remember once, man, I was, I was talking to this brother in Yemen, white American brother mm. that, um, hey, you know, was working, I forget, maybe as an accountant or something like that, or maybe as a consultant. He got involved with this Saudi Arabian woman. You know, they and they and they having a physical relationship. And so And they weren't married. And they weren't married. Mm-hmm. And when uh he proposed to her, she explained that, oh um, you know, you gotta become Muslim, you know. And he was like, you know, you know, I mean, what what does that mean? You know, mm-hmm. what like he comes like, what does that mean? And he said that she said, Look, my father will come to visit. I'm gonna teach you a few little phrases, a few little expressions. You say you knew the Islam. My dad would go for it. We would get married. Islam probably will never come up again. Right. He said he thought to himself, I mean, if I do this, I, I'm in love with this. Well, it's not going to kill me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It ain't going to kill me. He right. said that's how he embraced Islam. Right. Now, when I met right. him, the when, I met him yeah, when I met him, he was in Yemen studying Arabic. Mm. So when I said, yo, so how did you get from there to here? He said, when I was on my lunch break, I was walking past a mosque and I just said to myself, you know, if I wanted to go in here, I could because I'm Muslim. <laughs> you know what I'm mm, saying? And mm. he said that he just thought, man, what if I just walked in here? Right, right, right. What if I just walked in here? He said he walked in. He was surprised. Nobody was sitting on chairs. He, man, you know, he sat down. He listened to the khutbah and he said he kind of enjoyed it. Mm. At the very least, he was a little fascinated. Yeah. Right. You know, all right, all right. you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Started getting into the religion. He said, as he was deepening his commitment, his wife was saying, why are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> this was this was just a song and dance for my old man. You don't have right, to right. Do this. <laughs> why are you doing this? So, you know, right, right. You know, so my point is that everybody who, you know, I know guys that went to prison and, and became Muslim for protection. Yeah, like, affiliation. Yeah. Look, hey, look, man, look, I wasn't plugged. I didn't belong to a mob. And right. the Muslim guys, they seem nicer than old guys. And I just said, yeah. okay, man, look, Shadula, Muhammad, La, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, 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 That's, right. Hey, whatever, whatever y'all need me to do to keep these guys up off me, I'm yeah. ready. Very and common in prison. And then over some time, he became quite committed to Dean. Right, so my right. point is like to say like it was Palestine or it was hummus or it was uh Bukhleva or something like that. Right. It seems silly, yeah. but I've heard stories that people, you know, people they're entry into yeah, the Yeah, once song. you're in. Right. It, it, right. It, it, well, it, it, it was that silly, you know. What I, mean? I, I, I almost feel like that, that that's a really great point. And I think that well that, that's common that's a common experience of immigrant Muslims who who, whose like parents came over for economic reasons, their parent families may know nothing about Islam, and then they're like, "Oh, I'm Muslim. I don't know nothing. They don't know nothing about it." Like no, you know, what I'm saying? No, like yeah. I was telling my story. I didn't read the Quran until I was 19 years old. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. like, so like, I remember that. Yeah, you have the experience. Like you know, and I would be like, "Yeah, I'm Muslim," but you know, if and I was like, all that means is I can't eat pork. I can't mess with girls, but I want to. And this religious hold me back, you know, and then you yeah, know, but, it's, but, it's, but, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like Umar was saying in his his most recent article. Somehow we assume that everybody who's Muslim is like multism and practicing, right. and you go to the Muslim world, yeah. and it's like you know you're the only guy out there walking on the street saying Salam alaykum, Salam I remember I was in Jerusalem. It was a really shocking. It, you know, uh, experience for me as, as a young Muslim, the Adhan is called, we're at a, a, a masjid in the Mokayim Shafat, which is in East Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. I mean, the street is packed with thousands of people loitering. They're just sitting around smoking cigarettes, drinking tea and coffee. It's like five people in the masjid praying, five old yeah. men, mm-hmm. you know. So it, it, it's a real shocker uh, for people. You want to move on to other... Uh, yeah. Then, yeah, we, we, you got to keep it moving. So yeah. um, kind of segue, a li- well, we, we spoke a little bit about the black convert experience a little bit or the black American Islamic experience. Um, so Omar, it seems like you're positing that black American Islam is in decline. So Obey, do you mm-hmm. agree with that? And secondly, 100%. the question is, and why, and the main question is like, why is it in steep decline? 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I, I think, you know, and, and Uma does this well, man. You know, everything that happens, and, and a lot of political commentators, we talking about people, you know, pay talking heads. I, I don't think their social critique is as sharp um, as some of my friends, man. But everything that happens to, you know, uh, Black Americans, every social phenomenon, you have to place it in the larger context of what's happening in America. Right. So religion in America is in decline. That's correct. Yeah. You know, you know, institutional religion is in decline, right? right. So when you look at um, kind of the golden age of Islam, you know, in Black America, look at what was going on in Black America, you know, during those times. People were either A, still very committed to church. Right. You know, I mean, the, the Black American community was a church going community. Right. right? So, uh, you know, you know, embracing Islam in terms of uh, the kinds of Islam that they embraced, it wasn't it wasn't that much of a stretch. It wasn't, right. you know, it was, you know, uh, different in terms of the liturgy, the practice, but religious devotion was not something foreign to people. Right. Um, the other thing is that you had a lot of revolutionary activity. You right. had a lot of organizing at the grassroots level. Uh, you had a lot of, um, um, you know, you know, you know, I remember reading this article um, of this um, uh, this woman who was saying, you know, we make a mistake when we think that this latest iteration of protest culture is anything like the 1960s. She said, because this latest iteration of protest culture, people are really interested in just politicized versions of sex, race, uh, uh, sexual orientation. She said in the 60s, those things were connected to larger questions of like cosmic significance, man. People were looking like, what's my place in the world? So the experimentation was wider and more, you know, the experimentation was, whether it was like you say, Hare Krishna, Buddhism, different forms of socialism, communism, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was wider. So the fact that in that cultural milieu, black people gravitated toward Islam, that's not, I mean, yeah, that's the, I mean, alhamdulillah, I mean, we're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that, but it wasn't just uh, the unique gifts and talents of Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, you know, it was a, it was, this was a whole, this is a, this is a worldwide kind of religion, religion was a lot more popular, period. Religion and, was and, popular. Yeah. And, 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 and people were searching for answers right. in a different way. I think where the black community finds itself now is that I think it's a community that um, is much more inundated with popular culture. You know what I'm saying? So that, you know, and this is, and this is what's tripped out, man. The, 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 you know, it's almost like, you know, I've always esteemed the dynamism of black communities that you, that, that you could take a situation that, should be miserable and make the blues out of it. Right, right. Right, make a genre like blues out of it. Blues, um, comedy. Comedy, oh, you name it. Oh, but oh. I feel like what has happened in this generation is is like we've 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 made we've made art and culture out of this stuff so effectively that I don't even think these young boys even know it's the blues. Mm. Like, you know, I mean, they celebrate this stuff in the music. And celebrate this stuff, you know, on social, to where going to them and saying like, you know, man, there's a there's a better way. They looking at you, nigga. We got money. We we got we did cars. We got record execs paying us to propagate this culture. What could be better than this? So I, I think that in Black America, religion is in decline because I think the sense that something is wrong for which we need like divine intervention has faded away. But also, Obedullah, don't you think that there's also the element, you know, part of the Dawah appeal of Islam used to be the pimp preacher in the Cadillac. He just wanted yeah. to take money, right? And now, you know, people have seen 
some of the imams, you know, they may not be in a Cadillac, but, you know, they may have seen them in a domineering position and, you know, and, and yeah, 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 yeah. And the, and the mean, community yeah, not improving. Yeah. And and that's the other thing, you know, Umar was the, the, the first writer that I read that was willing to call it out. But if I'm being honest, man, and I, you know, subhanAllah, man, you know, a, a lot of the, mm, how can I say this in a way that's sensitive, man? You know, Black, Ameri Black American Sunni Islam institutionally has not delivered on a lot of its promises, man. Right, right. You know what I mean? A, a lot of the, the social dysfunctions that, you know, Black people embrace Islam to escape, you know, they're, they're still with us and we see them in our communities, man. It's a boomerang, but the second generation. Yeah, it's a, second it's, generation. It's, it's, yeah we, we didn't. We'd have come full circle, man. Full circle, come yeah. Full circle, you know, which, 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 you know, and I think there are, you know, Mahina, if we go past seven o'clock, we can go past seven o'clock a little bit. I know, I see you watching the time. Yeah, you know, he's the timekeeper. Yeah, you know, <laughs> a, a tight administrator. You know, yeah, I think, I think there's, all, I mean, it, it's kind of like, um, you know, one thing the Nation of Islam understood that I think Sunni Islam never caught up to. And, and, and did not recommit to was that there were very specific uh, kinds of social ills that one needs to focus on if you're working in black communities. Okay. Like, well, like, yeah, okay, this cut you right, because this kind of gets into the next question. And this is twofold. Number one, the, the image of a Muslim in the black community used to be of a righteous uh, person, particularly a righteous man mm -hmm. that was living more ethically than the people around him. And yeah. Islam had often took someone from the streets and created an ethical, hardworking family man. Okay, there you, go. One, right? there you go. And a lot of these communities now, the image of the Muslim is the guy at the corner stores selling malt liquor, drug paraphernalia, lottery tickets, pork with a cash register with Quran in Arabic on the cash register. Mm -hmm. they, yeah, call no. the, they call them the Habib stores in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. That's number one. So the image for a lot of people, and this is not just St. Louis, it's on the south side of Chicago, of it's in Brownsville, Brooklyn, it's you know all over the country. So for the image of a lot of people that's what it is. Also, Islam was exotic. People didn't really know there was no internet. Islam was what you told him it was, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The second part of that is, as a lot of these black massages have aged and faltered and become empty, there's been a reliance on Arab, South Asian, non-black money to stay afloat, mm -hmm. to pay salaries, to even mm -hmm. keep the doors open, and some of them have mm -hmm. still closed. And when you when you hear a talk on marriage in these communities, or you hear a talk on family, or you hear a talk on social ills, it's not the social ills mm -mm. of the of the affected communities. They're talking about we don't want to marry our cousins. We're talking about we have women with PhDs that can't find husbands. Those are all fine issues, but those are not issues in North St. Louis or outside of Chicago. Nah. Or the, see, you know, see, the, see, and but, but see, the other thing too, and and and. Even though the book wasn't accessible, you know, the book wasn't accessible, Dr. Jackson's Islam and the Black American, mm -hmm. he does a good job of pointing out how with the introduction of Sunni is see the the you know when 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 Islam was the nation of Islam, right? Mm -hmm. And other right. kind of proto-Islamic groups, right. the arch nemesis of that Islam was white supremacy. Correct. Yeah. Right. When Sunni Islam hits the scene, the arch nemesis of Islam in black communities becomes the West. Right. The Kafir, the West. The West, the West, right. the West. You know, and with that, uh, you know, certain kinds of, you know, institutional focus also um, fell by the wayside. So jobs. Right. Education. Right. Uh, uh, family stability. Right. You know, the, the, because th those were things that you could very easily, um, 
there was a very easy, I guess, nexus between those and just regular middle class American values. Right, right. And the nation did a lot better job with this. Because when I look back in time in the 1990s, you know, when the Sully movement is, is popular and misogyny are growing, I'm looking at congregations in retrospect, full of oh, yeah. young men, many of them convicted felons, no mm -hmm. job skills, no education, mm -hmm. no entrepreneurial spirit. Mm -hmm. Looking back, it's no wonder that most of them ended up dead in prison, back in the streets, marginally Muslim. The nation understood you had to build someone up. You had to so build the, them up. Yeah. Yeah. You had to build them up. Right. You so know, and, and, I mean, and, and, and even and even certain things that, you know, I think they understood what it meant to give a black man backbone. Right. You right. know, even even things, simple things, you know, that they focused on and emphasized the nation, like posture and the stand up straight. Exactly. You know, hygiene. Health. Diet. Mm. Diet. Hygiene. Right. Right. Work ethic. You know, right. uh, these these were things that you, you weren't going to find emphasized in the same way in the Sunni uh, Sunni community. Right. right. So I, I remember, have y'all read uh, Remembering Malcolm by Benjamin Kareem? No, I haven't seen no, it. I haven't read that. Uh, no. So there's a point, because, you know, Benjamin Kareem was the one that introduced Malcolm X when he the night he was assassinated, and he wrote mm -hmm. a memoir about him. Um, and he Malcolm would do something where even if his tie was, if he saw one of the, a brother in the nation with the tie being loose, he would check him like, hey, why is your tie loose? You know what I'm <laughs> saying? Like, like, it's something like every detail was like had to be dialed in. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. Well, now, go ahead, Omar. I, I, it's I'll say, even in St. Louis, we have uh, 21st World Alderman, John Muhammad, John Collins Muhammad, friend of mine. Uh, he's in the nation. Brother sharp. I mean, the hair always sharp. You know, he got, you know, the part, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, wearing the suit. You know, he's the sharpest dressed member on the St. Louis Board of Aldermen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I look at him, especially when he's with, you know, his fellow nation members, they're sharp and they have pride in appearance. And mm -hmm. they, it's just a certain dignity that they have. Mm -hmm. That quite frankly, we don't have. I don't have, you know what I'm saying? My diet's terrible. You know what I'm trying to say? I'm not <laughs> a lot of sharp dresser. You know, I, I, I'm at the Goodwill, man. You know what I'm saying? But uh, uh, they, they brought something to the table that was needed that Sunni Islam wasn't able to replicate. That, that, and that's it, man. I, you know, there's some things that you can only do. You can. There's certain kinds of like interventions, and there's certain kinds of like paradigmatic shifts that only make sense inside a person's kind of given cultural context. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I give you now. Look, bro, I want to make something very clear. I have never. People think when they see me that I, I got something against Jalabiyas and the imamas and so, well, Allahi, I don't, I don't. In fact, in the right context, that's a celebration of a kind of internationalism that Islam exposes us to. Right, and that, exactly. The, and, that, that, the, and, and that in and of itself, I mean, that's the essence of sophistication, that I'm exactly. a black man in yes. Chicago drinking Turkish tea. Well, not just, uh, we just had the Africa Cup, the championship, Senegal versus Egypt. You know Number what I'm one, saying? I didn't grow up watching soccer. You probably didn't either. You didn't grow up watching no, soccer. No, I, never okay. I didn't ever know anyone from Senegal. I never knew anyone from Egypt. You know what I'm saying? Man, look, I ain't, look, only, oh, it's only three, it was only three categories of people when I was growing up. You right. were black, you was white, and you was Puerto Rican. We only had <laughs> two. If you were Hispanic in St. Louis, back in the day, you was white. It was black <laughs> and white. That was it. So, yeah. so, so, so this internationalism that we've been exposed to, that's a good thing. I ain't never knocked a brother. Man is I, love I ain't yeah. never knocked a brother. No, I ain't. But what I realized is that we enter those cultures and we just use and dress here as an right. example. Right. We, and we're, but we're not really of those cultures. So a lot of times a exactly. brother come to like Salat al he got on some pajamas, man. Right, he got right. On, you know, he got on the he got on the, 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 the Saudi pajamas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, got yeah. on the, some, some some pajamas that a Saudi yeah. Arabian man yeah. Yeah. Would, would would never wear outside the house. Exactly, exactly. Now, the, now the reason I mention that is because I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, 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 now, the re, now, 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 I mean, he can he can redefine it as he wants to. Right, but right. I guess what I'm saying is that we don't enter those cultures 
with all of the the levels of right. you know it's it's almost like um you know the culture that we produce as, as black sunnis and in inner city community it was like a frankenstein culture right right you know it was like a uh or, or like a, a mr potato head you know you got the you know you got some different parts that you put together but they right. don't all go we the stuff not going where it's supposed to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not going where it's supposed to go. Well, I, I would tell you a funny story, but when, when you first, remember when I first met you, I said, you're going to go on the lecture circuit. That's what you need to get on the lecture circuit. You need yeah. to get out there. And uh, so I was promoting you. I was hyping you up. You know, I find little videos of them, send them to people. And uh, and a couple of people mentioned me, hey, what's up with this brother, uh, all them suits and how he dressed them, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Toes, they ain't got no koofies, you know. You know? So yeah, yeah. That, that's even come and think if, if 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 your Islam is tied to your dress, and again, like if I'm going to all we at the masjid, I wear a thobe. Mashallah. It's because I feel comfortable. You know, I'm standing for a long time, right? Also, you know, I'm an overweight brother, so I don't want to be constantly fiddling with my pants, pulling them up, you know, worried about I'm exposing my backside to the people in the back row. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah, you know, I, you know I, 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 I just saw some brothers out there like yeah. that, man. You know, I just yeah, left Texas. You know, you know, back in St. Louis, when I was in Texas over at uh, Omar Suleiman Masjid at Valley Ranch, there's no barrier between the men and women, right? So the women are right behind you, man. So I was always paranoid, you know, <laughs> about, about my backside, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, when people see you in the thaw, they're like, oh, man, you back on that selfie thing. I was like, no, nah, man, I'm just, you know, trying to protect my own. <laughs> Well, yeah, that, that reminds me when low-rise jeans were a thing back in the day. You see, everyone's crack. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, 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 I just seen, I just seen a few brothers at the mess here like straight plumbers, man. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Straight plumbers, oh. man. Got the two Are you gonna pull it down. And yeah. yeah. Straight plumbers. All right. So on the, the, this this topic, this this specific subtopic was about. I think you kind of alluded to, but the real question is. Racism and classism among South Asians and Arabs, right, Omar? That's yeah. what that's that was. And yeah, I mean that's that's a specific question because um, we're told that Islam is a universal brotherhood. This mm -hmm. is part of the selling point, you yeah. know, Malcolm and Hajj, etc. But we know the Muslim community is no different than any other community. There's tribal divisions. There's colorism. There's racial divisions, ethnic divisions. Uh, there's no ex Islam Muslim exception to this rule. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the class dynamic is also big because a lot of us come from working class backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I know I do myself, you know, I we, you know yeah. And um, I remember going to these uh, predominantly South Asian ma masters for the first time and uh, people talking about servants. I never, I never knew anyone that had a server. I never knew anyone that hired someone to clean their house. So, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a totally uh, uh, foreign experience. And I quickly realized that, um, you know, if you didn't have an engineering or a medical degree or particularly a STEM degree, um, you kind of were put, you know, kind of in a second or third level as, as far as how people view you. And we know there's, there's a history to caste and, you know, the culture of the subcontinent, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But um, we never really see issues of race, you know, because... You know, we had Ferguson to Palestine, right? So people were quick to say, hey, you know, Mike Brown's just like the Palestinians, right? But they weren't quick to talk about why is there, you can't get beer in North St. Louis if it's not from a Palestinian or an Arab. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You can't you get know, a hand, man, you know, yeah. It, you know, it, it's, it's, it's deep. I mean, you know, that, that piece right there is deep. Because, mm. you know, there, there's a few different sides that you can look at it from. Yeah. You know, so like my background, my mother is an educated woman. Mm -hmm. And I and I say this without reservation. And my father was a street person. Right. You know, right. mother was educated with my father. Um, you know, uh, he just passed away recently. But, you know, my father for his mm -hmm. entire mm -hmm. life. And I'm only I, I feel comfortable talking about it because this is how he would introduce himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a recovering addict, you know, for mm -hmm. his entire life. Man, you know, that heroin really had him, you know, right. bad. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Um and my mother, she tried to instill in my and me and my sister, um, you know, a, a, a really strong commitment to academic 
success, excellence, et cetera. And it's strange because I always had uh, challenging courses in high school, I took advanced placement courses. and But among my guys that I hung out with, it wasn't like they ever, it wasn't like the stereotypical, why are you talking like a white guy? So right, that, right, right, right. That, right. That, 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 come on, man. No, nothing like that. But it wasn't, the fact that I knew that I had an interest in uh, school and education, it just wasn't something that I could share with them like that. It mm. just, you know, that wasn't a part of us hanging out. Mm. You know, we hung out, we did what we did. And on Monday, I was the guy taking advanced placement humanities and literature. And it was just right. kind of like this compartmentalized, separate part of my identity. And what was really interesting about becoming Muslim, and this is probably, we talk about like shallow intentions, in becoming Muslim, this is one of the first places that I felt like being black and having knowledge, mm. having ilm was something celebrated. Yeah, celebrated, it, yes. It was something that, you know, it was like, man, this is a community, I'm talking about black communities. This is a community with guys that I would identify that they was hitters. Guys right. that was real guys in the streets, people that we told stories about and looked up to. But the person that they looked up to was the person that could speak that Arabic, yeah. do some Quran, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, could, could get up and give a nice bayan, give a nice khutbah. So it's weird that Islam entering the Muslim, the Muslim community space among Black American Muslims, that was one of the first places that I felt like gave me license to to strive for knowledge yes. and to be like yo man people like this in terms of the 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 other angle you can look at this from is i think that a lot of us forget man that black people in america and white people have a special relationship yeah you know we have a you know james baldwin would, would speak to that often that you know one of the things even you know whether they're black activists or black you know uh, organizers and also, you know, white organizers, white activists, very few people talk about the relationship between black Americans and white Americans. Mm -hmm. These are two groups of people that know each other very well. Right. 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 And there's a, you know, there's certain, there's certain things that like, if we're in dialogue, black people and white people, there's certain things that don't even need to be said. Right. 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 What I think black people forget is that other people who enter this country, they don't have the same relationship with black people or blackness that white Americans do. Mm. So for them, their reasons for being here are clear. I'm here to get money. Right. I'm here to amass as much political power as I can. I'm here to get my children into the best schools so that we can make this wealth generational. And, and, and plant the seeds of this continuity, I'm here. And they don't have any reservations about that. They don't feel like they owe my black tail nothing. Right, 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 right. They looking at me like, the fact that you're not doing this, what's wrong with you? You know, right. there's got to be some kind of inadequacy, inadequacy or deficiency that you're not doing this. Whereas I think white Americans kind of understand, we talk about systemic, inequality and a historical legacy of oppression and so but, but, but like we also have to remember that um a lot of our families before i said that, i want to address something you first said islam really for a lot of people is the first place you go where knowledge is respected right mm -hmm. you know i was a bookish kid mm -hmm. not around bookish people you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying there was there was two books in my house the Bible and the cookbook, you know, but me and my, <laughs> the, the cookbook with the red and white cup. <laughs> right. But me and my sisters devoured books and still do. Mm -hmm. You know, I had 129 books last year. I think I'm going to beat that this year. You can follow me on, on Goodreads if anybody's interested in following me. But um, I never had anyone to discuss what I read with until mm -hmm. I became a Muslim. Ismail mm -hmm. Royer, Ismail was the first person who I knew who read books too. And then I went to the masjid and I would see these brothers like Naji and Pianski. You know, Naji is a street guy, Islam transformed and bookish guy, places where knowledge was respected. These were people coming from working class backgrounds. 
many of them came out of the system. Not all of them, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. knowledge was what? Religion and knowledge, you know what I'm trying mm -hmm. to say? So, yeah, so we respected each other more. The PhD didn't mean nothing to us. The medical degree didn't mean nothing to us. You know, what <gasps> it was the knowledge and it was your dean that we cared about, right? Absolutely. But, but but the second part is we have to look at this in terms of particularly our South Asian uh, brothers and sisters. You know, we're not getting the working class come to America. You know, we're getting nah. knowledge. We're getting, we're getting people that came from the upper crust in South Asia coming to America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are coming here directly to the suburbs. Yeah, of you know, course. It's funny, you'll see, you'll see you know, uh, uh, double doctors. The mother and father is a doctor, grow in the suburbs, and then the kids go to college, and they, all of a sudden they put in a Twitter bar, you know, marginalized and oppressed. You know, this is, <laughs> they're, they're literally in the top 5% of humanity. In terms of wealth, oh, 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 Omar, let me let me explain to you, <laughs> Sarah Michael. <laughs> let, 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 Omar, let me explain to you real quick about like because yeah. you see that, and I and I know what you're talking about because yeah. I'm from Ohio and it's the same setup, right? right? St. Louis, the Midwest. If if you, they see is coming to the Midwest, they're coming for academia. But then you've got the I was watching the uh, HBO. There's an HBO series with Lisa Ling on like cooking and food take going out to eat right i watched it last night they had they had because i watched it they have a they have an episode about bangladeshis in new york city and no i've seen it i lived, I lived in right. brooklyn you know, so, so, so i, mean, I, I feel, I feel yeah. like in the in the big city like new york Toronto, and chicago new maybe, jersey chicago maybe detroit even like ham traffic yeah. that area oh, oh, those sure. people are like coming up they're not like going to the burbs they're going to their own like ghettos themselves no no no, no. So, I, I look i know about the the yeah. pakistanis of brooklyn and yeah. brighton yeah. beach coney island the bengalis of the bronx and queens no yeah. that's the working class community you know? right when we're talking about places like st louis there is no inner city city daisy community right they're in the western it's, suburbs it's, 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 it's chicago yeah. there is so I guess, I guess, but yeah. I guess what I was what I was trying to say was yeah. that the idea that um, they would migrate to America to be in solidarity with me it right. was a fatuous and silly idea to begin with. You yeah, know? exactly. It, you yeah. know, that's it, it's almost like I feel the fact that I think Black American Muslims, working class White American Muslims, fail for that. Yeah, I yeah. Feel, you know, I almost feel it was not even say. Yeah, how gullible must you be, right? To 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 think that yeah, these people travel from America, travel yeah. from Bangladesh, so that they can come and live in the inner city next to me and fight yeah, for yeah. racial justice. Yeah. <laughs> it's pure, pure, pure fantasy. Pure. I mean, they're here to do what they should do, which is get that money and get it for the children, education. The idea this was a religious fundamentalist fantasy that they were going to come here. To live in North St. Louis, which is more dangerous than Gaza, more dangerous than war zone. I mean, statistically, more dangerous. You know, the the, the death rate for Black Americans in the city of St. Louis is 144 per 100,000 homicide rate. The idea that they were going to move here for that in some religious solidarity. I mean, they could have been religious idealists in Bangladesh, in yeah, Karachi. You know what I'm I mean, <laughs> yeah. The idea that we thought that, right? Was so yeah. I mean, it's yeah, almost yeah. like, come on, man. I, it, thinking that people would stand up on members and talk like that. Yeah, yeah. Thinking about it now, I'm offended. Right, I'm right. offended. Whereas yeah. what, what needed to be said was like, look, man. Yes, I, you know, we, we expect some brotherhood and sisterhood. Right. I, I think, you know, that that's to be expected. But right. in terms of communal uplift, yeah. it's something that we have to do, man. Right, you know, right. It's something that we have to do. Yeah, so no, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I've never sat around with any black American, white American Muslim saying, you know, if only those rich Muslims in the suburbs would help us. And actually, <laughs> and actually, yeah. actually, yeah. Brother, actually, like actually, when they do help, it can hurt more than it helps. More than because it helps. help isn't free, and then you lose your self sufficiency. You lose you, you lose control of the agenda. Lose your authenticity. You lose, lose your authority. Lose exactly. control of the agenda. And then yes. in the in, and then in your community, especially you know, internally and even externally with non-Muslim community, you lose your respect. Lose your respect. You lose yeah. your respect. 
You know what I'm saying? Ubaid, I, mean, I, mean, I, I want to actually like mention something. You, you, you touched on a point. Like about a, during the pandemic, I was talking to a brother that we in Chicago that you, that you and I are mutual friends of mutual friends, and he was he, he had a project he was proposing to build a Muslim community in Roseland, right? And Omar mm-hmm. Roseland used to is like kind of like a you know a rundown neighborhood in Chicago, but used to be very prosperous back in the okay. day. It was Roseland, a magnificent. Bro- you right. might you might have heard of Rosen as the wild wild hunts. That's Rosen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Rosen yeah. is the wild wild. So I and I and I went to with his brother, and you know, and, and I remember I liked what he was doing. So my wife and I we went down and checked out the neighborhood and looked at some of the property. But like you realize real quick when you start talking to, but you need money, right? And the thing is, yeah. one of the reasons for Roseland was that the the city was about to invest a lot of money into it in the next couple of years. It was coming. Because the yeah. surrounding areas got invested into, so you kind of yeah. wanted to be, get there, get in, get property, and build a community. There used to be a masjid there in Roseland that you could kind of like build around. I guess there used to be community back in the day, right? Yeah. So we no. were trying to, yeah, we were trying to build like a a more like a like you know not not just African Americans, but also white folks, Daisies, Arabs, right. people who right. like minded second generation to get out there, right? right? But at the end of the day, like a lot of us, man, I, I live in the suburbs now. A lot of people mm-hmm. I was pitching to come out and give money to, they're in the suburbs. You've already got comfortable, so now I, I'm trying to pitch them to come live in the hood. <laughs> right. Well, there's, you know a, there's, a, there's a gender divide here, too, because what I learned on, and this is going back to when Abu Muslim was getting people moving to East Orange, mm-hmm. and even at that time, at the height of adoption Salafi in America, mm-hmm. a lot of these families, the wives didn't want to go. Mm-hmm. You know, you had a lot of them moving from Northern Virginia, they had been down studying at the Mod. Or in the comfort of sub- suburbs of Washington, D.C. And East Orange is the hood. You're right next door to Newark. You can walk to Newark mm-hmm. from last year there. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the wives did not want to go. And at that time, I'm like, what, man? They're not on this dean. They're not on this downward. You know what I'm saying? But looking back, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a matter of safety. It's a matter of comfort. It's a matter of just standard of living. You got to be but, real. But, 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 but on the other side of that, though, yeah. I think for people who are willing to move into the inner city, I think there's a lot of economic prosperity. Well, there is if you do it the right way. If you do it the right way. Because, you know, you got you got people that do it. I mean, they're usually denounced as gentrifiers. But, right. you know, if, if it, it, I mean, don't get me wrong. I think I understand somebody who wants to, you know, remain in the comfort of, you know, American suburbia. I get right. that. Although me, the suburbs never been my taste. Man. Yeah, that's not my thing at all. I can't. No. That's why I told the people down in Dallas. The Dallas community corny to me because it's a suburban community. Yeah, yeah, I can't. Yeah, I can't you know, man. Everybody I, driving I, around their SUVs. I and, you, know. you know, I live in yeah. Bronzeville, and I've yeah. never wanted to live anywhere but you know in a major metropolitan area right, right, because right. I see that there's opportunities. You know. Uh, there's just there's a different kind of opportunity to, to, it's more like to make to make an culture. impact yeah, and to yeah. make an impression. Yeah. And if you make an impression, it will mean something. Yeah. It also, in the suburbs, you've something. never seen anybody. Everybody's just driving around in their cars. You never yeah, see anybody. That, yeah, you yeah. can't you can't I mean, make an impression on anybody. You never see anybody. You never see anybody. Yeah, that's that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, right. Right. Uh, so, way, next, yeah, yeah, so so it's twelve after seven. Obey you, 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 you guys want to do a hard stop at seven thirty? Is that gonna be cool for y'all? That's like eighteen. Because I, I don't think we're gonna have any questions. So I'm gonna like kind of pick the questions that have kind of flowed with okay. our conversation so far. Right? Yeah, the mental the mental health one is important though. We got to get to that one. You you, you want to cover the mental health one? Okay. Yeah, um, I think that's, I think that's an important question. Yeah. Okay, so so let's talk about uh, this. This is how I'll do it. I, I will pair up six leading to seven they can kind of incorporate some stuff into five right okay so the first question is when does piety become extremism mm. i think piety becomes extremism when it neglects practical concerns mm. when it neglects um prag- when, when it totally denies the relevance of practicality and pragmatism, I think it becomes, I, I think it becomes, uh, you know, uh, extreme in a blameworthy way. Right. So examples would be like, let's say people who like maybe 
will rent their apartment for rent forever or they can't it makes it might be more sense economically for them to just get a house right meaning like you, you mean? know work, work, like one of the things that i think we 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 tend to forget and i remember studying sharia i don't know why man i was at Azhar, and this opening line to a a, a contemporary fiqh study just it was like a, it just like struck me man like almost like lightning man he said remember the author said nothing that you do in obedience to allah that allah has legislated in his sharia will benefit allah mm. All of the Sharia is to benefit you. <laughs> he said, nothing that you do will benefit Allah, right? It's all to benefit you. So if you are in a context and something is, is things aren't working, that does not mean that we can just go and wholesale, just change all of the ahkam of Sharia. But at the very least, we should be interested in analyzing what is not working. Why is this not working? And then from there, we enter a conversation and we try to posit and proffer solutions, adjustments, etc. Piety becomes blameworthy and extreme when we're unwilling to even answer those, ask those questions. We're unwilling to even say it's not working. If somebody say, yo, man, we got a certain understanding of marriage and divorce and a brother telling me I've been married 16 times. 17 times he told me man i will change a woman. which is not uncommon in in the grassroots in the community yeah, man i will change man i change a woman like a pair of drawers right right just like that now I, now look and he can even give you references from the sira from hayat al-sahaba yeah. yes so Allah was telling him about different companions of the prophet that divorced many times some of whom are people after we name our children after right. these people, right? And tell me, look, divorce is halal. What we what we talking about here? And I and I and for me to say, yo, man, you do realize in a capitalist system, with the kinds of communities we live in, the family, the nuclear family, is the unit of economic success, right. stability for your children. This is not a tribal society. Right. right, and when you weaken that, now sometimes things don't work out. We, you know, divorce is halal, but when you weaken that, you have to recognize that in this context, you are weakening our ability to uh, to form a community and then to perpetuate the message of that community. You and, weak, and, that ability is weakened, and not just that piece that you mentioned, which is one hundred percent correct, but. I think when you ever you you do you use religion as an excuse to do self harm, yeah, to, to to take your kids out of school and put them in the mountains of Yemen, to take your kids out of school, <laughs> you know. I mean, when you when you're obviously to any logical person doing self harm to yourself and your children in the name of protecting yourself from the society, in the name of religion, I think you've left piety. And went to the field of, of extremism. Now, Mahin, can I segue to mental health uh, real quick? Yeah. So, I, I, like, do, do you yeah. want to talk about that? As far as like, in the effort to be pi in pious, sometimes it's almost like you're trying to jump ahead and being fake. You're know trying to I mean? be fake, but 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 yeah. Well, we have two things. Yeah. Uh, number one is everyone in the Muslim community is under pressure to appear to be the perfect Muslim. Everybody's the perfect Muslim. Nobody's mm -hmm. flawed. Nobody smokes weed. Nobody has marital problems. Everyone shows up to the at the masjid, and they're perfect Muslims. Everyone's on WhatsApp, and they're perfect Muslims. And that's why I think places like Talif are important because these third spaces have opened up. And say, hey, we're at different places. We're at different levels of practice. We're at different <laughs> levels of observance. But there's a door open for you if you want to come here. Now we're not putting a stamp to say everything you do is halal but we're saying there is a space for you to come and that's why i think talif and places like that are, are are important but there's a lack of mental health professionals that can work with muslims i know a lot of muslims struggling with mental health issues and several of them have told me i would go seek help 
but I don't think there's a, a therapist that is culturally competent, that understands Muslims, that understands our issues. You know, I, I think, I think, man, you know, I, I think there's that, that that's a that's a question or an idea that can be approached from many angles, man. Hold on, mm -hmm. let me close this door right quick. Hold on. Mm -hmm. The kids must be wilding out. Oh, yeah, yeah, they go, they go, they 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 they're going nuts down there, man. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, that's a question that can be approached from many angles. On the on the one hand this pressure to perform you know like muslims have produced a very toxic hierarchical culture where everybody who when people are in a group sometimes you can feel the insincerity in that we're all vying to be who who's the most knowledgeable who can who who can display their piety uh, most stridently, who can who can be the most uncompromising? Man, that I, man, I grew tired of that in like five or six years, man. You know, to to come around and sit with people and to quote books that none of us have ever read, but we're quoting <laughs> somebody. That we're quoting somebody who quoted the book. Right, right, but right. When when I saying, yeah, I heard in this lecture. We say, you know, and Ibn, Ibn Taymiyyah's Fatali. Yeah, you yeah. ain't never read it. You, know, you can't even read Ibn Taymiyyah's Fatali. Right, right. What, what, are we, what, what, are we, what are we talking about here, man, right? So, you know, it's a performance, man. It's a performance. And I think that the kind of dissonance that that produces for a person of faith, it can be devastating to your faith. It's really when, when the Prophet them described riyah or ostentation as a type of shirk, it re in terms of how deleterious it can be, it really is a form of shirk, man. Because at the end of the day, when you go home, so a little voice says to you, "Everything you just did that was that was a performance." That for was who? A performance. Yeah. For who? For yeah. who? And then you in the community, and th and this becomes like the primary way that you engage with the community. So that man, you know, one teacher of mine, he said, man. You got people been Muslim 20, 30 years, their beards have grown more than they have. Right. Right. He, he, this, this is the same guy 20, right. 30 years. Because in order to change, the first thing you have to do is be real with yourself, man. Right. I ain't gonna get nowhere lying to myself. But but that's why Talif is needed, I think. Because mm -hmm. now Talif, in a little in a criticism, is geared toward you know the, the upper class the you know it's not really a working class space but we need places like talif and i think we have that in st louis with the thursday night brotherhood class and people can just go and be themselves you don't have to go and put on an act this is work man please i can't do it tell mom i'm, I'm working man. okay just relax yeah yeah Oh, let me let me just make my baby a favorite airplane. Like, hold on, oh, no problem. Hey, that's important right here. That's important. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, you're not gonna make one for two. You just no, remind, I'm, I'm, I'm making one. I'm making one. One paper airplane. One paper airplane. Just make sure don't crash. MIA flying like plane. <laughs> I like MIA, by the way. Yeah, it's like a need to be so. I, I guess alluding to your point, you, you kind of uh, Omar, you were saying that the, this kind of being trying to be fake. And trying to be per this perfect Muslim, at least having the image. It's it's all about the image, right? It's about and the it's image, and you have a dis you you're causing some kind of like um, incongruence, or so to speak, right? Well, let me tell you something. I mean, I just it, it it's Don't damaging to the up. mental health for people to to have two lives, Close but door. not just damaging to the mental health of people. It's damaging. Period. Mm -hmm. There's two different situations I know about right now where children are, are being sexually abused in mass mm -hmm. spaces, mm -hmm. in which the families, and we've seen this happen in a number of places, the families have pressured the kids to stay quiet. Why? Because of this culture of toxic shame, this culture of reputations. We don't want the kids to be damaged goods. It happened here in St. Louis, but fortunately the, the family stuck by the kids. And the whole time they're, 
we had some people here talking about the honor of the brother. I don't care about the honor of the brother that's violating children, right? Nah, so, so honor of the brother. Right. Nah, cool. What about the honor of the victims? So what, what I'm saying is this two-faced culture of putting on an act, yes, it's damaging to our mental health, but also it can be very damaging uh, and, and, and abused when there's no piety involved. It's all about the performance. It's all about the reputation. It's all about the act. It, it's and I think and I think too. You know the other aspect of this man that I that I also think is 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 worth noting is that the biggest dip when I, I you know because I'm I'm interested in this man. I, I talk to Muslims and I say Muslims that 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 see therapists. I say what what is it about therapy, man, that you 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 find it something that either a works in concert with your you know, we're seeking religious guidance, or B, you seek uh, as an alternative to mm. kind of talking with an imam or a sheikh or a chaplain or something like that. And the the I, I I hear two things consistently. One is that I want to be heard. I feel like when I talk to religious folks, they're so ready to give me an answer. And judgment. So, yeah, you know, it's almost like, you know, part of what we want, especially as we as we as we wrestle with mental health issues and issues of adherence and observance, I want you to see me, feel me, hear me. Don't just rush to tell me a ruling or rush to, you know, think that you're gonna be able to wrap this up in 30, 35 minutes and just give me some kind of religious, right. okay, boom, boom, boom. This is how you you know, I want somebody to, to, to hear me and understand how I got to this place that a lot of religious leaders don't express um, um, a great interest in learning. Well, how did I get to this place where I'm hitting my wife? Right. How did I, you know, because it might be going back and undoing that. Right. It might be going back and, 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 and redefining or settling or resolving some things that haven't been resolved and religious leaders are not always as interested in doing that. And the second thing is trust, man. That, you know, especially people that have had um, bad experiences with religious leadership, there's no trust there. Right. You know what I'm saying? You know, which, which I tell you, man, as somebody that has been asked to counsel people in different capacities, there's some people I, I can see it in their eyes. As long as you're talking to them like a regular person, they're listening. The minute you say call the law, they stop. It's like, okay, now I, I, right. I'm not listening no more. <laughs> when you, the minute you say, you know, there's a hadith, uh, they're not listening no more. Right, right. You know, and I think to myself, subhanAllah, that's, you know, man, that's that's a crazy reality that we have to confront. So I think as you And also some people have conditions. Mm. And, and, and 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 we're being and we've been taught a lot of times in religiously fundamentalist communities that any of these issues are spiritual. Yeah, it's just it's just they, they, it's just they, just need, they just need a, a, a spiritual remedy when some people actually have something going on physically, right, with their mind, etc., that needs to be medically uh, addressed. You want to move on? Uh, well, 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 I, I, like Omar, I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, you mentioned because Obey's example right there, where people. They relied on religious scholarship and then they kind of at some point got burned. I want to ask you kind of straight up is like you earlier in the show kind of talked about your reverence for these elder figures. And you mm. always talk about your reverence for Sheikh Abdul Rahman. But then mm. when you speak about the people, uh, most of the people of the Mashaik on the scene today, you ain't really like I'm like, hey, I'm not really about that. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like or can you what's your you obviously because because you say i don't care about these dead people or these old scholars but you obviously have reverence for scholars mm. but just not like can you uh, i want to give you an opportunity well, to well, explain well, that a little bit real quick cause, yeah i put it like this is is uh uh i have tremendous love and respect for Sheikh rahman and what he did um just like i have tremendous respect for, well i put Sheikh rahman in a category by himself because as he said, he made dawah to the gangbangers. So he went to the grassroots and built grassroots community and built people up at the grassroots level. There are other people that I spent time with that I have tremendous respect for too. But I'll put the sheikh in a category by himself. 
even though I have a tremendous amount of love and respect for him, I'm no longer where I was at that moment in time, right? So I'm no longer in the frame of mind that I believe religious fundamentalism can answer every question in life, politically, socially, mentally, et cetera, right? Um, but he spoke to me socially and culturally to where I was at at that period of time. And if it would not have been for the Sheikh, and if it would not have been for some of these brothers that are in the Thursday night class now, I more than likely would be dead now or incarcerated. So they were definitely the medicine I needed at that time. But I'm no longer at, I'm no longer that same person. I'm no longer at that level. So answers strictly rooted, um, rooted in religious fundamentalism to me uh, are no longer necessarily what I'm looking for. You know, I'm a deep student of history. I'm a deep student of politics, of sociology, of St. Louis history. I, you know, Islam is my education, but it's allowed me to see the world. It has allowed me to understand St. Louis in a much better way than I ever would have. It's allowed me to understand so many things. But quite frankly, you know, I'd say Ubaidullah, Suhaib, uh, there's a lot, a lot of other people that I can look at today, and this is not to disparage them, but to say just I can listen to them and I can feel like I'm getting something beneficial. Or I can listen to them and I feel like they're speaking to me uh, where I'm at. And there's quite a few I can listen to and I can't, I just turn it off. You know, they're not speaking uh, to me um, at all. They're not speaking to me socially. And also, <clears throat> If you look at what I'm reading, I read a lot of scholars, but they not necessarily be Islamic scholars. You know, they're historians, they're sociologists, they're political scientists, they're social scientists. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning uh, f from all, all of those sources. You know, man, you know, the, the thing about that is, you know, there's a, there's a secret there that, um, you know, it's almost like the, the, the taste that we have uh, for different kinds of food, mm. you know, and certain things grow on you and certain things, you know, you, you lose the taste for them. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? Um, it's always amazing to me to go back and listen to scholars that, or listen to cassettes that I used to listen to 20 mm. years ago. And I listen to this now and I'm like, what did I find so compelling about this? You know what I'm saying? What did, what did, what did I find? And, 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 I, and I hope that, you know, maybe in 20 years, I'll look back on the stuff that I was doing and think, yeah. what, what, what was I saying? What was I even talking about? Man? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What was, why did anybody find this meaningful? I yeah. think that's just, that's just a natural byproduct of growth. Well, yeah. you're interesting. You I, mentioned I, that. I go back and read old articles yeah. that I've written. And I was like, man, I, I don't, man, I can't believe I wrote that. I don't know who liked it, you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah. There's a there's a really old cassette <laughs> tape. Like, Yo, I don't know why I thought this, I thought this was this yeah. thing. Right. This, I just show I just show my wife now because YouTube YouTube is amazing. Yeah, I yeah. just show my wife on YouTube lectures like, "Yo, this changed my this sent me on the trajectory of it." Yeah. Like, for real? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? I know brothers that went to the master because of Khalid Abdul Muhammad on Ice Cube's death certificate uh, album. <laughs> Something can spark you. You know, yeah. you know how many people, you know how many people I, I, I know that they say Kali Yassin's purpose of life. Mm -hmm. Kali Yassin, yeah. yeah. That joint, you know, man, that joint yeah. changed my life, man. They yeah. listen to it now, they like, I mean, it's still pretty good, but it didn't hit me, it, did, it doesn't hit me now like it hit but me you know, you know, different things hit people differently. That's you know, right. this is not a this is not a diss on him, but uh, I have never. There's never been a time in my thirty years as a Muslim where I've listened to Hamza Yusuf and and I've ever not wanted to hit the eject button immediately. <laughs> but, mean, you know, a lot a lot yeah. of people look, but but I love. I've always loved Imam Siraj Wahaj. I've always uh, loved Imam Siraj, right? Uh, and when I lived in Brooklyn, even when I lived in Queens, I used to take two buses. To get the message to talk with. Just, mm. just, just, just to hear Imam Siraj. And a lot of times he wouldn't even be there. He'd be on the road. I'd be mad. You know, they <laughs> right. 
right. you know, but, uh, guest speaker. But I, but yeah. I think there's some talk. There's some talks that like sometimes you get rusty with your salah, with your prayer. And once yeah. one of the first talks I listened to like 20 years ago is a talk called "Why Don't You Pray" by Yusuf Idris, Sheikh Jaffer's son. Yeah. It's a cassette. Oh yeah, I love it. It's a friend of mine. I love. I love it. you. Let me you tell pray? you. Let me tell you something. I remember that the Idris family. The, there's two families. The family of the late Babur Hassan, who just passed, he was down in Boca Raton, Florida. This was a Pakistani American Muslim family here in St. Louis. Very pious family. Uh, Bedro, Sister Kanis, uh, his children, um, and Jaffer Sheikh Idris family, Yusuf Abdul Rahman, Abdul Minab. This, this family is a beautiful family. And I remember that lecture. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with Yusuf back in the day. I learned a lot from that whole family. But this is, I don't think we can approach that. They're from a Sudan. I don't think we can approach that level of Islamic piety without that kind of generational peace. You know what I'm trying to say? Like they have something natural, you know, it, you know that we don't have. I don't think we can attain just realistic. You want to you, you know something that's wild, man? Yeah, yeah. From the time I embraced Islam, I, I always loved Sheikh Hamza Yusuf's lectures. I listen to Sheikh Hamza's lectures, man. Yeah. I, I always loved his lectures. I, you know, but, but, I check know. It, but check this out. So, uh, this is why I didn't finish about Siraj Wahaj. I remember years ago, I was telling somebody, man, you have to listen to Siraj. And the first thing he says, why is he screaming? You know? <laughs> And, uh, and see, me, I grew up in the fire and brimstone, Baptist church. Yeah, you go Southern I, I, Baptist. I grew, up, I grew up with Baptist preachers who screamed. And I like that. That's right. And I don't like the speaking style of a oh, Jack Brown or, yeah. or a Humble Yusuf. You know, I don't care if they Muslim or not. If they talk, they could be talking about what's going on at the grocery store. You know what I'm saying? I don't like that speaking style. It's going to put you to sleep. It's going to put me to sleep. It's going to put you to sleep. Right, right. Yeah, so it's, it's seven thirty-five right now. Seven thirty-five. So I, I want to give it to obey. Yeah. Obey. Like you, you yeah. want to do one more question, or do you want to wrap it up? Do one more. We do one more. All right. Oh, 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 Omar, your pick from the list you sent out. I'm oh man, on my phone went to sleep. Let me let me pull this I, I, list I, I, off. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you real quick. You've got so the the other questions we got are is too much too much politics a bad thing? Can politics replace piety? There's Muslims in conspiracy from Jews to COVID. Why are Muslims so prone to conspiracy theories? The American Muslim future, and I, I okay. made a notable. So, w which one do you want to go? Okay, with? I, I'm 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 gonna wrap up. I'm a, I'm gonna combine two of these together. Okay, okay, because we already talked about politics. Yeah. Politics cannot replace religion. Politics cannot replace piety. I think we're all in agreement on that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm gonna combine these two questions. Number nine, conspiracy, and number eleven, gender relations. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Now, now regarding conspiracy, and uh, I, I'm glad to hear uh, uh, Maheen, who's, who's recovering from uh, from Omicron variant. You know, I'm trying to say he's back there, but <laughs> Muslims in general. Now, back in the day, it was always Jewish conspiracies. Yeah, brother, <laughs> you cannot go to Starbucks. You know, and then Mac McDonald's every Monday and Thursday, they gave their prophets to Israel. And just think how ludicrous <laughs> that conspiracy is. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, a, a, a publicly traded American corporation would take two days of profit, which is essentially you know about one third of their profits, and hand them over to anyone. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just think, think how absurd it was. But Muslims seem particularly vulnerable to conspiracy theories. I don't care what it is. You know the conspiracy theory out there. Muslims are more prone to believe it than the general public. A lot of times it has to do with Jews. A lot of times it has to do with something else. But that's number one. The second part of the question is, and I don't know how I'm going to combine this, this is some creative license, uh, is on gender. You know, um, and I'm not trying to take a go at anyone on this podcast. But all I'm going to say is this. When you talk about there is no marital rape in Islam and consent is with the nikah uh, and things of that nature, right? This is maybe fine for some abstract academic discussion. Right. One thing I can tell you for sure, in the United States of America, you will go to jail. Yes, yeah, if, right. if, if, if the police come to you and you say, well, hey, it's, 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 
but it's, it's not prosecuted like rape, but you will go to jail. Yeah, you will go to jail. You say, hey, you know, she may have a black eye, but the consent is with the nikah, so I'm all good. No. Like, you got to put these, you get, you know, you, you sort of, these are discussions that are not beneficial to live in a, productive, a productive life when women are getting master's degrees and medical degrees and, and, and working class Muslim sisters are out there and, you know, they, you know, they see what their coworkers are and are putting up with. So I don't think we can thrive as a community without number one, better gender relations. And what was I tying this into? Oh, and conspiracy theories until we dump all these uh, conspiratorial uh, uh, thinking. Well, well, oh, and, you know, you, you, you talk about landing the plane, man. Omar trying to crash the plane. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you know, consp you know, when conspiracy theories are attractive to people, it's usually a sign of their inability to live in reality. Right, right, right. right, right. You know, um, however, you know, look, Truth be told, I got a tin uh, full hat under my jacket. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, got, I, got, I got a tin full hat under my seat. Oh, uh, man. Myself from the 5G, dog. Oh, man. <laughs> it, this, it's not COVID. I, it's the 5G, dog. Yeah, it's the 5G, <laughs> yeah. No, no, but, uh, but, uh, no, man, real talk, real talk. I, I, think, I think there is great utility in conspiracy theories just to keep our mind open to the possibility of great concerted evil you know mm -hmm. i don't i don't think a person should go off the deep end to where they start basing key and critical life decisions on unsubstantiated far-fetched theories right, right? When, you, when you're making decisions about your health the health of your children about you know your finances but for for people to remain aware that man you do have people that have vested interests in um uh things remaining the same or some things worsening i don't i don't think that makes but, but, no, but i'll say that i'll say this someone said it so it's not my original statement but i i agree with this statement it's easy to think everything is a conspiracy when you don't understand how the world works. You see? Yeah, so, I mean, so if you're coming from a low point of knowledge, everything can seem like it. I guess what I'm saying is yeah, that yeah. I, think, I think it's easy to believe everything is a conspiracy if you do understand how the world works. Well, you know, certain so, things. There are certain conspiracies. There, I mean, there are things that are documented. We we know that there are things that yeah, you know, so, so like, it's, like, it's, like it's, whatever Snowden somebody, brought out. Somebody says, yeah. If somebody says, for instance, um, you know, uh, like the, like okay. the vaccine, like but the vaccine, on. for instance, right? The yeah, vaccine. Right. Okay. The person says, man, the vaccine once it gets into your body, it becomes an implantable microchip. Yeah, this, yeah, is what, yeah. this is what Professor Griff was talking about. Well, right, 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 right. This, is, this is the implantable uh, yeah, you know, yeah. bio microchip. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's that's. I, I I don't I don't believe that. Oh, do you remember the one back in the day that flavored sodas were being injected into the black community to reduce the sperm count? I don't <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know I don't I don't believe that. But for but for somebody to say, man, I don't think that big pharma has the, the best interest of the people at heart. Now, I'm back. Yeah, that's a different thing, because we saw what happened with the opioid crisis, and, and, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Say, yeah. But now you're talking about two different levels. Now you're talking about two different levels now. You're talking about two different levels now, because you know I mean? you know, we saw what happened with the opioid crisis. So that's you're talking so, about, so you're talking about to, one. To, 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 to say, if somebody says, I think that banking institutions are really the most influential aspect of the american economy i don't think that's a conspiracy mm. <laughs> I, think, I think i think that's true you know what i'm saying so it's, it's it's i i guess i guess what i'm saying is that yeah man the exotic far-flung theories come on man i mean you know i mean how the world works i mean it appeal to you right but, I, mean, I mean you know the ones we used to hear back in the day you know like nine secret nine arab presidents were secretly jewish and the king of saudi arabia wasn't jewish <laughs> 
but as a baby he suckled from the breast of a jewish woman therefore his mind was uh uh, uh secretly possessed by jew you know stuff like that so i mean that's silly stuff man. Right, 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 right. what i'm saying is that come on man we got to let go of the silliness but we right. do got to retain that 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 critical posture you know that critical yeah. and what about the gender that, what about the gender piece because it seems man, like you know, i mean to be to be to be honest man you know one one thing about gender relations yeah Gender relate, and this is this is where, where you can see how discombobulated we are as a community. Mm. Gender relations traditionally, it it, it it never really comes down to Sharia. Gender mm. relations are always modeled. Mm. You know, always. You know what you what you understand to be normative is usually based on what you've seen. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you know, what I'm saying? You, you know, it's, it's how you so if you if you see your father treat your mother a certain way, nobody's gonna be able to tell you in some kind of like scripturally empiricist way. No, no, this was supposed. No, this this is what's normative to me. For a community that does not have norms, it becomes dangerous when we're trying to create norms out of books of film. Mm. Trying to create norms out of you know medieval text, yeah. uh, that becomes very dangerous because those texts are speaking to context, realities, um, expectations, shared expectations between men and women that do not exist in our time. Right. So, 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 yeah. so like, so I, I give you a primary example. I, I give you a primary example. My, my, you know. I made the decision, um, you know, my wife bought this book by a writer named Stacy Patton called, yeah, I know her. Yeah. called, called Spare the Child. And right. It was about a uh, physical beating being mm. kind of this vestige of slavery and this relic of a slave past and black parents rely too heavily on physical beating. And the book has such a profound impact on me that I decided to stop spanking my kids, right? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Now, my mother will see me and she will see my kids, you know, taking certain liberties that we didn't take as children. Right. And my mother look at me like, Will, whoop they ass, man. Yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What, what, what are you doing, man? Yeah, what but that's, a, that's an example because I got my ass beat daily growing up. <laughs> daily. You know what I'm saying? You know, and I'm not alone. A lot of people did. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people did. I mean, I got, I mean, my father had this maneuver. He would open the door with one hand and take the belt <laughs> off with the other. You know what I'm saying? And he was efficient with it. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so the, 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 uh, 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 and I used to believe in it. You know, hey, but look, but this, but look, oh my, this, I don't point, believe in though. it no more. Yeah. This, my, no, this, my point. When mm. my mother says to me, whoop them kids, right. Mom, and my mother is a, is a beautiful, gentle, kind mm. woman. She is not saying demoralize your children. Right. She is not saying destroy your children's ability to connect with you as adults. Right. She's not saying make your children hateful and resentful towards you. Mm -hmm. She is making this suggestion in a context or in her mind, a context where none of that will happen. Exactly. Now, I might know something different. Same thing happens when we read those old fifth books. They're talking about gender relations in a context where, like, if, if this happens, they don't they don't think that this is going to happen because there's right. no way a religiously literate Muslim would want to see that happen. But but oh, better not just the old fic books. When you have people in America watching these lectures by people in Saudi Arabia or other countries that are married to their cousins, their mm -hmm. parents are cousins, their grandparents mm -hmm. are cousins, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Tribal families, it's just not mm -hmm. applicable to how our families it's operate. Fool, I mean, you know, I mean, that's a that's a that's a fool. Man. It's it's almost like it's like somebody looking at some clothes being worn by a model that's you know six to one hundred eighty pounds, right? And the clothes looking good on him, and they five seven, two hundred fifty pounds, thinking it's gonna look just like that on them, right? You exactly. Know? And, you know, it's it's kind of like, hey, you know that that. What I say to every man and every woman, if you want marital success, the first thing you need 
is to think about your partner. Mm. That's 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 paramount. That's key. I don't care what I read. I got to think, OK, if I strike my wife lightly, how do I think that's going to go? Right. Do, do, do I really believe that she's going to say, damn, babe, come right. to think of it. You're right. <laughs> you got some women now that's going to come back with a two piece. <laughs> hey, look, look, look. Or a hey, nine millimeter. <laughs> hey, no, my wife, I'm gonna do you one better than the two piece. Right. She coming back with the two piece. She coming back with the lawyer. She taking yeah. half of what I got. Yeah, exactly. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be estranged from my children. Right. I'm talking, but, you know. right. But also, like, look, the, like Talif as an example, right? These are highly educated women, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are kind of on the edge with religion, right? You know, they're somewhere on the assimilation project into America, you know, second, third generation. And they kind of don't really know if they want to do this Muslim thing or not. You mm -hmm. know they kind of don't know. They got options, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and one of the quickest ways to remove the Islam option for them, you know, is to start talking, you know, is, is to start talking about some of these uh, uh, thick uh, issues that are not applicable to the American experience. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, see the thing about it. Sometimes, you know, and I think that this is this is an issue with with you know academics and academicians and thinkers. You know, sometimes I think we're not really thinking about speakers and teachers and stuff like that. We're not really thinking about the applicability of what we're talking about immediately. Right. You think about like a bigger issue. So like for instance, I'm watching the Bill Cosby documentary, right? I'm watching the Bill right. Cosby documentary. And the Bill Cosby documentary, that joint was wild, right? It yeah. was wild, man. Hey, you, hey, your boy, your boy Bill was out there. Then putting pops. Hey, look here, baby. It was, it was, it was a hey. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hey man, you know, right? So I so and people younger may not realize this. In the 80s, the Cosby show was the number one show in America, in America. year after year. Yeah, dominant yeah. on the culture. Bill Cosby was America's dad. I'll never forget I was about nine or ten years old, laying up in the hospital, calling the Glennon Children's Hospital in South St. Louis. I was in the hospital a few months and lung issues, and Cosby show it just came out. Mm. And the show was so popular. It was so huge. And we had Bill Cosby, Prince, and Michael Jackson. And those three men kind of on the top of culture. Yeah, and, yeah. And sure. see these kids, man, you know, all our heroes are dead or in jail. And it, it, it was real sad for us because Cosby was so big for us. Not just that, Fat Albert, you know. I mean, we look at the movies that were Sydney Portier. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uptown Saturday Night, Let's yeah, Do It Again. Man. You know, but, yeah. but, so, but without, what, so me and my wife watching this documentary, and, and, the, and the same scenario kept coming up. The, the women would take drugs with Bill. Of course, Bill says the drugs were administered consensually in his right. deposition. The women said that some of them said, yeah, I, I act, you know, I, you know, I took the drugs consensually. Some of them said, you know, he put them in my drink unbeknownst to me, right? But then they would say, you know, they, the mind would become foggy, they befuddle, they wake up knowing that they had been penetrated. And right. the, the legal question was, can a person who is kind of groggy and not exactly present, can they articulate consent? Yeah. Can, can, can they consent if they're not? And the case law is moving on that. The case law is moving on that. Yeah. Right. Right. And so what, what I was explaining, and this is where you can get into some trouble. Then don't don't cut the tape before I finish. <laughs> I, was, I, I was saying that, come on, between bet, between married people, who can say that they haven't attempted to initiate sex with their spouse while the spouse was asleep? Yeah. But because consent is entailed in marriage, right. that's not that's not now if the person says no, I don't want to do that, or something like that. We get into you know a separate a separate kind of section of issues, but in as much as marriage itself is can is synonymous with consent, I understand what some of those contemporary speakers like Dr. Jonathan Brown, who I know you and him don't have a good rapport at all, and you ain't got to go into that. I ain't got to go. I ain't, ain't got to go to my boxing challenge with uh, Jonathan go Brown. No. He'll be in Chicago. He'll be in Chicago next weekend, by the way. I right, set it up, man. Get a boxing ring for it. <laughs> 
<laughs> you ain't got to go into that. But, yeah. but I, I, I understand how an attempt to address certain like contemporary issues or kind of, you know, pre-modern issues like concubinage, you, you end up talking about stuff that for you is just kind of like intellectually, well, it wouldn't be marital rape, but it would be dog, you know, it would be harm. And, mm. But in the immediate people listening and thinking how they should behave with their wife tonight, it's right. just like you said, it's just not useful, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I and, and a lot of people, down to right. It's yeah, it's not yeah. like yeah, because it's like okay, if she's like you could be like a like like sometimes if your wife ain't feeling, she might be sick, and and if you want to get it off, she's sick. You gotta make a decision. The smart thing to do is just like hey, I'm just gonna take it. You know, it ain't gonna happen tonight. She's sick. You, you know sense. what? Man, you right. know what? You know what? You know what? I you know I'm, I'm gonna say this, man. And we really gonna wrap up. Now we just kicking it. This is yeah. like you know. The Muslim version of locker room talk, <laughs> you know, the, you know, one one hadith that you know, I know many unscrupulous men have probably used talking to their wives who weren't interested in sex. If if a man sleeps angry with his wife, the angels curse her until the morning, etc. You know what? You know what? I don't think anybody, very few people, realize about that hadith is that she didn't want to have sex. And he slept angrily with her. He didn't take the sex. Mm. That, 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 that hadith is actually saying, look, if there is some consequence, because she may be justified in not wanting to be with that man. If there is some consequence, it's a spiritual consequence. Let the angels, let God deal with it. Let the angels deal with it. You don't have to force yourself on this woman. Right. And you can feel that, hey, look, if there's some consequence that I'm being I'm being denied a right of mine in this situation, then it ain't it ain't for me to to aggress this woman or force myself on her. It's for me to know that if I'm really being neglected here in some way that is an affront to my, you know, marriage, then the consequence is spiritual and that's it. Okay, well, we're in the locker room and in closing, I'll just say uh uh if she ain't feeling it, just like the brothers in joint will say they got two wives. Hey, 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 Right, right. Um, real quick before we wrap up, um, I know Omar is riding with the Bengals next weekend. Who you got obeyed for the Super Bowl? You know, my 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 heart, my heart. I, I, I like I like the young kid Joe Burrow. Remind remind me of the spunky QB. Remind me of Jim McMahon, baby. Right. You know what I'm That's saying? Right. Um, but you know, if my head my head is definitely said L.A. Rams, Matthew Stafford. You know, Cup. It's going it's going it's going to be interesting, man. It's going to be interesting. But I'm 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 a, my pick the smart we don't gamble we don't we don't gamble but the no smart gamble. money is on the Rams man smart go Bengals because I'm, I'm, how the Rams and Stan Kroenke did St Louis I got to stay thorough with Joe Burrow and I think they're gonna pull it out yeah I, and I gotta go to Cincinnati Buckeyes you know what I'm saying there's like five Ohio former Ohio State players on that team so you know uh, no, no brainer for you know, me I, 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 I would and the head coach from St Louis by the way. Dude, you know, we was we were big football fans as kids, man. So I remember the last time the Bengals were in the Super Bowl, Icky Woods, guys Icky, like that. Icky Shuffle. You know what I'm saying? The Icky Shuffle and the, yeah. 40, the 49ers tore them out the front. Yeah. 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 Joe Montana the Rice, baby. Yeah, man. You know, right, right. Right, right. But man, but Maheen, it's been fun. Oh my call me, man. I'm around. I'll call you. Make sure I'm in the chat. We gotta get going. All right, All right wait. Take care, fellas. All right. All right.